Hello, my name is Schizo Saint. Today I'm going to be doing a complete history on the Georgia Guidestones. The Georgia Guidestones were destroyed about a year ago, and since that has happened, it has been completely memory hold, meaning people don't talk about it, it is not brought up in the wider conversation, and the group of people that used to talk about it, aka people like me, people interested in conspiracies and the wider implications of those theories and the evidences for them, we have completely forgotten about them, so I am making this video as sort of a permanent record, so that way we may never forget the Georgia Guidestones, who built them, and what the implications of its messages were. This video is actually just going to be two videos in one. The first section is just going to be a very basic timeline of the Georgia Guidestones and what they said and when they were destroyed. It's going to be as factually based as possible with little to none of my own opinion. After we go over that, I'm going to end the video with what I think about the Georgia Guidestones, what were they meant to represent, and why were they destroyed. So let's get into it. Sometime before 1979, a man that goes by the name R.C. Christian visited Stonehenge. This R.C. Christian was fascinated by Stonehenge, the fact that it was built by Stone Age people before complex tools were invented, the fact that it accurately predicts many important astronomical events. This R.C. Christian thought that a similar monument could be used in North America, except this one would have a very clear message engraved on the stone walls. R.C. visited Joe Fenley of the Elberton Granite Finishing Company and commissioned the structure. Joe Fenley thought he was absolutely crazy, and to discourage him from wanting to proceed further, he quoted R.C. Christian that it would cost about $400,000 in today's money to build such a monument. To Joe Fenley's surprise, R.C. Christian was totally fine with the price, and him and his, quote, small group of fellow Americans were more than happy to pay the price to build this monument. Joe Fenley also reported that R.C. Christian said that he and his group of people had been planning on building this for at least 20 years, so I'll touch more on that later on. The Georgia Guidestones took less than a year to complete from the time that they were originally commissioned, and they were done by March of 1980. They were 19 feet tall, and were constructed of four primary slabs connected by the top by a square slab with a concrete post in the middle. On the four primary slabs were written, I guess, ten rules or inscriptions, similar to the Ten Commandments. Let's go down the list of those inscriptions. The first rule said, maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Two, guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Three, unite humanity with a living new language. Four, rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Five, protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Six, let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in world court. Seven, avoid petty laws and useless officials. 8. Balance personal rights with social duties. 9. Price truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. 10. Be not a cancer on the earth, leave room for nature, leave room for nature. And although this is the part of the Georgia Guidestones that gets the most airtime, there are additional interesting inscriptions on a tablet that was located just a few feet away from the monument. On this tablet was, were a few interesting things. For one, it had the following inscription. The Georgia Guidestones, center cluster erected March 22nd, 1980. And then below that it says, let these be a guidestones to an age of reason. Around the edges of the square were written translations to four ancient languages, one per edge. Starting from the top and proceeding clockwise, they were Babylonian, Classical Greek, Sanskrit, and ancient Egyptians, which was in hieroglyphics, of course. On the left side of the tablet was a list of some astronomical features featured on the Georgia Guidestones. A channel through the stone, which indicates the celestial pull, the horizontal slot indicates annual travel of the sun, and the sunbeam through the capstone marks noontime throughout the year. It also has listed that the sole author of the Georgia Guidestones is R.C. Christian himself, and that this was sponsored by, again, a small group of Americans who seek the age of reason. It also states that there is a time capsule placed six feet below that spot, and that it was to be opened on, well... We actually don't know. That part was left blank. When these guidestones were unveiled in March of 1980, a congressman, Doug Bernard, unveiled it in front of an audience of about two to 300 people. 
he read a message from the people who sponsored the stones to the audience. The message read as follows. In order to avoid debate, we, the sponsors of the Georgia Guidestones, have a simple message for human beings, now and for the future. We believe our precepts are sound, and they must stand on their own merits. Keep in mind, again, to this point, we actually do not know the identity of this Robert Christian. It is a pseudonym. And for six years, it continued to be a mystery as to what these were and what they were meant to represent. However, in 1986, a book was published called Common Sense Renewed. Inside, the author wrote the following. I am the originator of the Georgia Guidestones and the sole author of its inscriptions. I have had the assistance of a number of other American citizens in bringing the monuments into being. We have no mysterious purpose or ulterior motives. We seek common sense pathways to a peaceful world without bias for particular creeds or philosophies. The Georgia Guidestones were criticized from the very, very beginning, especially by the Christian right and anybody who was daring to even think about a new world order or anything like that. But they were especially liked by Yoko Ono. Yoko Ono is John Lennon's wife, or I guess technically ex-wife, uh, rest in pieces, and she praised the Georgia Guidestones as a stirring call to rational thinking. Very interesting. Before the Guidestones were destroyed in 2022, they were defaced a number of times. In 2008, they were graffitied with multiple slurs and multiple threats to, quote, kill the New World Order and that Jesus would beat the Satanists. A year later, someone just splashed a bucket of paint on the monument. The Georgia Guidestones for decades would remain not at the center of the conversation of the New World Order, but as something that would inevitably be brought up. This was also one of those topics that History Channel would cover very liberally. If you stumbled onto History Channel at one in the morning in the year 2012, there was a good shot you would learn about the Georgia Guidestones. They would inevitably pop up. Things like the... American Stonehenge and the Ten Commandments of the Antichrist, those kinds of phrases would be associated with the Georgia Guidestones, and anyone that was into the stuff back then can tell you that what I'm saying is correct. The monuments continued to stand controversial for years. However, at four in the morning on July 14th, 2022, man, two years, has it already been two years? The Swahili and Hindi language slab exploded into a million pieces and a nearby CCTV camera caught a silver sedan speeding away from the scene. That morning, residents could not only hear the explosion, but they could, quote, feel the explosion. And it does take a considerable amount of explosive to make concrete fly that far across the property. As far as suspects for who blew up the Guidestones, well, no one knows. No suspects have been identified, which is lucky for them, because if they were caught and convicted, they could face up to 20 years in jail. And that's really where the story ends. The city council has talked about rebuilding the Guidestones, but so far nothing has really happened and nothing's manifested out of that yet. No suspects have been identified. And weirdly enough, as they were demolishing the rest of the Guidestones, no time capsule was found. Where the time capsule allegedly was, there was absolutely nothing. The Guidestones have been returned to the original Granite Company, and that's really where the story ends. So where does that leave us? Did we ever figure out who R.C. Christian is and his, quote, small group of fellow Americans? Partially, yes. Back in the year 2015, a small documentary film crew and a group of internet sleuths almost completely confirmed the identity of R.C. Christian as Dr. Herbert Kirsten. Now, what's interesting is a lot of the rhetoric online speculates that Dr. Herbert H. Christian was a devout racist and follower of David Duke. There's a little bit of evidence for this, but there's not a whole lot, so I don't really want to speak too much to it. It should be said he was born in the year 1920, and of course he was a doctor. He was part of the academic class. We cannot forget that it wasn't that long ago, literally less than a century ago, that mainstream academics and mainstream scientists were seriously speculating on the ideas that, of course, there are certain races that are superior to other races, that other races should be cold or prohibited from breeding to spread their awful genes. This was not niche. This was mainstream science until very recently. So if he did hold those views, it wouldn't be surprising at all. It's just hard for me to source it. 
R.C. Christian isn't even the most interesting person involved in the creation of the Guidestones, though. It is his friend, William Shockley, that I find way more interesting. This is the gentleman that invented the transistor. In July of 1945, the War Department asked Shockley to prepare a report on the question of a probable casualties from an invasion of the Japanese mainland. Shockley concluded that if we did invade the Japanese mainland, we would lose about 5 to 10 million Japanese, and it would cost the United States about 400 to 800,000 dead American soldiers to do so. This report caused the American government, or at least influenced them, to drop atomic weapons on Japanese civilian centers. William Shockley, of course, was also a devout racist, and he was also a eugenicist and believed that brown people generally should be prevented from breeding to, quote, prevent the general IQ and average IQ of the population from decreasing. At the end of his life, he donated sperm to a sperm bank because he believed that his genes should spread into the future. So that is as much of the relevant and known proven facts of the Georgia Guidestones that I could find. Keep in mind, there's plenty of alleged connections to the Rosicrucians and Freemasons. And although it is interesting, I couldn't find any real direct proof that the Freemasons were directly involved in the creation of this. I feel like if you erect any cement monument anywhere and you put Egyptian hieroglyphs on it, people are immediately going to think it's Freemason in origin. So... Although interesting and entirely possible, because there's no real proof, I didn't really include any of that. I put an interesting Substack link in the article if you want to go a little bit more down the Freemason rabbit hole with the Georgia Guidestone. Now that we have the facts out of the way, we can start talking about the fun stuff. What were the Georgia Guidestones built for? Keep in mind, moving forward, this is basically my opinion, but I don't hold any views about these and aren't that controversial. So let's take another look at the, quote, Ten Commandments of the Georgia Guidestone. The first commandment of the Georgia Guidestone is that we must maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Now, I'm speaking anecdotally here, but I went to elementary school in the early 2000s. Okay, I'm a young buck. I vividly remember when we were talking about environmental issues that this idea would come up. The idea that there are too many people. The word overpopulation was pretty common uh, in that space until pretty recently. And so this is not a new idea. This is an idea that originated with eugenesis, but has since been adopted by the climate movement. Let's go to number two, guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Well, now that we know who built the Georgia Guidestones, we know that this is basically just coded racial messaging. Now, rule three is not that offensive. Unite humanity with a living new language. Well, that certainly would make international communication more convenient. However, it should be said that if you are a student of the book of Genesis, you might associate the idea of a united language with the same evil group of people that built the Tower of Babel. Now, why were they evil? What was their sin? They thought that by building structures and utilizing technology, they could come be with God on their own terms. At least that's always been my interpretation of that story. So with that in mind, rule three to me at least is a little startling. Now, number four is interesting, and to some of you, it might be highly problematic. Uh, to some of you, it's totally fine. So rule four, rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. This all depends on your perspective. If you think enlightenment liberal values are the way forward for civilization, then you have no problem with number four. Sure, people can have their religions, but it shouldn't override reason and rationality. However, depending on how devout you are to your particular faith, you might have a problem with this because in many religions, faith is the most paramount thing, most paramount virtue that you can have. And so... Depending on what you believe and how strongly you believe it, you might have a problem with the idea of faith being ruled by reason. Now, numbers five, six, and seven on their surface don't seem that bad. We need to protect people with fair laws. We can't have any useless officials. And nations should resolve internal conflicts and resolve external disputes in a world court. Of course, this was the original idea behind the League of Nations and eventually the United Nations. Now, Again, not even really anything that bad here. I especially really like number seven, but the problem is the underlying principle. It implies that there is an overriding group in charge of deciding all of this and enforcing all of this. Depending on your views, you might have a problem with the idea of a one world government deciding the actions of every single individual on earth. 
But depending on your views, you might think that is exactly what humanity needs right now. Personally, I find it absolutely abhorrent and disgusting, but that's just me. Number eight, balance personal rights with social duties. Again, if you are an enlightenment liberal, you might have a problem with these devoted and devout Christians constantly talking about their quote unquote God given rights. They're constantly touting that they have a right to whatever opinion they want and they have a right to keep and bear arms. They have a right to go to church during a pandemic, endangering the rest of the population, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, they should be sacrificing those rights to the social duties, to the greater public good. Now, I don't agree with that at all, but that's not a very controversial view among many people all over the world. Number nine, prize truth, beauty, and love, seeking harmony with the infinite. Honestly, again, on its surface, pretty decent advice. It depends on what your definition of harmony and infinite are, but nothing to complain about there. The last commandment of the Georgia Guidestones, however, reveals the underlying message of the entire thing. Be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. Obviously, human beings, we've been pretty hard on nature, especially in the last two centuries. Industrialization and agriculture have deprived the planet of many of its forests and other natural wonders. However, to our credit, to our great credit that we don't get enough credit for, we have taken massive steps to preserve and restore the wonderful nature that we have on this planet, especially here in the United States. We have 67 national parks. We have tens of millions of acres of public forest land that anyone can go to and enjoy. And we have tens of millions of acres of Bureau of Land Management land, which also governs other natural resources. Deer populations in the early 1900s were as little as 30,000. And now white-tailed deer populations, I believe, are in excess of 3 million. Human beings, we make mistakes, we do things that are wrong and evil, but it is within our capacity to correct those mistakes and to fix our mistakes. The solution is not to be suicidal. You see, to believe that human beings are a cancer is enormously and incredibly evil. Because with cancer, you don't tolerate cancer, you don't leave cancer around, you do everything you can to kill it and become cancer free. In my opinion, the underlying doctrine of the entirety of the message of the Georgia Guidestones is that the world should be ruled basically by academics, scientists, people who understand the golden path that humanity needs to follow, people who know better than the average plebeian, people who will guide reproduction, make sure no human being is born unless it meets the standards of the regime, that religion will slowly deteriorate and die until the human race becomes a small, amorphous blob that is whatever the academic community wants it to be. I find this completely repulsive. I imagine some of you, though, will be okay with this. So how do you fight back against the extraordinarily anti-human and wicked message that the Georgia Guidestone pushes? How do you push back against the incredibly powerful, rich people who still flaunt, believe, and push this propaganda to this very day and will continue to do so probably until the end of history? How do you fight back against this? If you love humanity, if you love religion, if you love your nation, how do you fight this? Well, there's a number of different ways. I think getting a little bit of firearms training wouldn't hurt, and I think doing what you can to stand up for good ideas whenever you can in a civil way, I think that is also an appropriate action. But I think the best way, the most powerful way to fight back against this wickedness is to fill the earth with good people. Be the dad you never had. And if you're fortunate like me and you had a good dad, take that good example and become a parent yourself. I know the world is evil and our children will face challenges that people our age and people who were born, you know, in the 1900s, I guess for lack of a better term, they're going to face challenges that we could never imagine. But the reality is it has always been a bad time to have children. People had children during the Great Depression. People had kids during the American Civil War. People had kids during World War II and on and on and on. 
Just because things are awful and uncertain, that doesn't mean that you get to abrogate and reject your responsibility to the planet to fill it with good people. If you are a decent person, and especially if you can find a decent person to have a child with, you have that responsibility. And believe me, I'm not going to lie, it is difficult, it is hard. It's kind of expensive, but more than anything, it's extraordinarily time-consuming. But you will never feel a greater and deeper sense of joy than when you hold something in your arms that you and someone you love created together. God gives us this incredibly limited ability of his own power to his children, that ability to create. Use it righteously. Be the person that your child deserves and do everything you can to make your child the person that the world needs. That, my friends, is how you can fight evil in our time. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like the video, please leave a like and please comment. I would love to hear your thoughts, constructive criticism, and your own theories about the Georgia Guidestones and what exactly they were for and who blew them up. I have a feeling that we will never see a serious criminal investigation as to who did it because, of course, the powers that be are the ones that wanted it destroyed. That way, it could be memory hold and completely left out of the public conversation. Hopefully, this video can stay on the platform for a very long time as a digital memorial so that we can never forget what the Georgia Guidestones were, who made them, and why. Please, guys, subscribe if you want to see more content like this. I love doing this. I love making videos like this, so I would really love your support. If you want to support the channel, please check out Civilian Expedition Outfitters in the description below. Thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and for the love of heaven, go outside.